In this video we're going to discuss compounds and formulas. At the end of the video I'm going to go through a moderately and extensive list of example problems as well. So what do we mean by a compound and how do we indicate what the compound is using its formula? So a compound is two or more different atoms chemically bound together. The atoms or elements that are present in a compound are always there in the same ratio for a given compound. We call this the law of definite composition. So if I have the compound ammonia, which has the formula NH3, a sample of ammonia will always have three hydrogen atoms for every one nitrogen atom. And if it doesn't have that ratio of hydrogen atoms to nitrogen atoms, then it's not going to be ammonia. Every sample of ammonia always has those two atoms in that ratio. Now, there are, it is possible to have different combinations of the same elements, but that will indicate that we have different compounds. And this is referred to as the law of multiple proportions. So for example, C2H6 contains both carbon and hydrogen in the ratio of two to three. Or if we want, we can say we get one carbon for every three hydrogens whereas methane contains carbon and hydrogen again, but they're in a different ratio, one to four. And so these guys are completely different substances and they're gonna have a very different chemical behavior. Methane, we produce large amounts of it um, in our you know, intestinal system. Ethane, not so much. It's not really, it's only produced in very small amounts by microorganisms as part of their uh, metabolism. Similarly, if we look at two compounds composed of both of them, hydrogen and um, oxygen, we have water, which we need to drink, you know, relatively large amounts of it every day in order to keep our metabolism working properly. And then we have hydrogen peroxide, still contains hydrogen and oxygen, but the ratio is different. You can't drink large amounts of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is commonly used to clean wounds, and sometimes it's also used as, a, you know, like a mouthwash. But you wouldn't want to be drinking large amounts of it. So it's important to recognize that the atoms or elements that are present in compounds can only be separated by, um, from each other by chemical means. What we mean is that you have to break the connections, break the bonds between the atoms in order to separate out these different types of elements. In contrast, the different bits that make up a mixture can be separated by physical means. So there's a very big difference between a mixture of say oxygen, and hydrogen and H2O2. The atoms that are in a mixture of oxygen and hydrogen, the oxygen and hydrogen atoms aren't bound to one another and it would be possible to separate those guys from each other by physical means. Whereas in something like hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, although we have two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom, these atoms are actually connected to one another. And the only way we would be able to separate that out into hydrogen and oxygen atoms would be by breaking the bonds between the atoms. So when we look at a sample of matter, if it's possible to physically separate the components of that sample into different parts, then we have a mixture. If it's not possible to separate the different components in that sample into different parts or into individual parts, then we have what's called a pure substance. That is, if it's not possible to separate those parts physically. Now, pure substances can be of one or two types. They can be compounds, if it's possible to break that um, pure substance down chemically into multiple different elements, or they're an element if when you even break all of the um, chemical bonds in that substance, you still just end up with a whole pile of the same atom, then that's an element. Now, for our mixtures, we can, we can classify it as either being a homogeneous mixture, also known as a solution, if it has a composition that is uniform throughout the entire sample or a heterogeneous mixture if the composition is variable through that sample that is a sample of one region might be different from a sample of another okay so some compounds and some elements contain molecules molecules are two or more atoms chemically bound together and there's a variety of ways of characterizing molecules one way of characterizing molecules is by describing how many atoms are contained in your molecule. For example, 
A diatomic molecule is a molecule composed of two atoms. A triatomic molecule is a molecule composed of three atoms, and you guessed it, a tetraatomic molecule is four atoms. Now, the atoms in molecules are held together by a chemical bond, and the type of chemical bond that holds atoms together in molecules is called a covalent or sometimes a molecular bond. What's important to recognize is that molecules behave as a single unit, a little bundle of atoms stuck together. They're a package of atoms. So this thing is going to move around as a whole unit. Okay, They are connected to one another, the component atoms that are present. Now, another way of um, characterizing a molecule is on the basis of whether the atoms that are contained in that molecule are all of the same type or of different types. So homoatomic molecules contain atoms of the same type. These are elements, right? A pure substance that contains a homoatomic molecule is an element. So something like N2, right? Nitrogen is a diatomic element, contains homoatomic molecules and also diatomic molecules. Okay, so they're describing different things. Homo is telling us that the atoms are all of the same type and then di is telling us that our molecule contains two atoms. Heteroatomic molecules contain atoms of different types. You know, there's a couple of atoms that are being repeated here. This is a water molecule. Two of the atoms are the same, but there's a third atom there that's of a different type. So pure substances that contain heteroatomic molecules, they have to be compounds because we've got more than one atom type present. So that guy there would be a triatomic molecule and it would also be a heteroatomic molecule. Now, not all compounds contain or are composed of molecules. Some compounds are composed of what are called ions, and ions are atoms or groups of atoms that are connected via chemical bonds that have acquired, and we'll talk about how they acquire this later on, either a positive or a negative electrical charge. So electrical charge is a property that can be either positive or negative. So it has the sign. The sign is either positive or negative. It also has a size, and it can be either like plus one, plus two, plus three, so it goes up like that, or minus one, minus two, minus three. So it goes up in integer amounts. So we indicate the sign and also the size of an electrical charge. Now, ions that are positively charged are called cations. And you can remember this because cations are positive, right? Cat ions positive. Or some people say positive. Okay. But that's a pretty easy one to remember. How we indicate the charge on the ion is by writing as a subscript, either a plus or a minus. If it's plus one, we just put a single plus there. And if it's minus one, we just put a single minus there. So something like C or minus. If the charge has a size that's bigger than one, we put the multiplier of the charge out the front. So we might put three plus, two plus, etc. We don't ever write one plus. Okay. So that's how that works. That's how we write the charge there. So in the first case there, we've got the sodium plus one ion. And then we've got this ion here, NH4+. Plus. And then finally, we would we pronounce this as Ba2+, plus. that's the barium 2 plus ion. You can see that these guys are individual atoms that have acquired a positive charge, and whereas the middle one here is a group of atoms that has acquired the positive charge. Now, negatively charged ions are called anions, and you can remember that because it's a negative ion all right so you just say a <laughs> negative ion 
And you can see here that we indicate a negative ion just a negative charge just like a positive charge using a superscript minus sign and then if it's bigger than minus one then we put the size of the negative charge out the front of the minus sign. Okay, so that's it, right? That's how the um, we write the formulas for these ions. Now, it's important to recognize how these ions interact with one another. Ions that have the same electrical charge, they repel one another. So two positives will repel one another, two negatives will repel one another. Whereas ions that have opposite charges will attract one another and ultimately will become stuck together. And when two ions attract one another and become stuck together, we form what is referred to as an ionic bond. So some compounds are composed of molecules and we call those molecular compounds. Now other compounds are clo um, composed of ions and guess what we call those? We call those guys ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are composed of combinations of cations and anions. Remember that cations and anions are attracted to one another. And what happens is the ions arrange themselves in a regularly repeating pattern that maximizes the attraction between the oppositely charged ions and minimizes the repulsion between the ions with the same charge. So it keeps the pluses and the minuses close to one another and the minuses and the minuses fairly far apart and the pluses and the plus fairly far apart. And what we end up with is a crystalline material held together via ionic bonds, held together via the attraction between positive ions and negative anions. So in an ionic compound, no molecules exist. So we will often talk about for an ionic compound what's called the formula unit, and I've highlighted it here. And the formula unit is the smallest package of ions that can be repeated again and again and again to build up the entire crystal. And you can see that if I just copy this over and I just keep copying this over, I can build up this whole crystal just from that little um, collection of one sodium ion and one chlorine ion. So pure substances are either elements or compounds. In an element only one kind of atom is present, in a compound two or more kinds of atoms are present. Now elements are either composed of individual atoms that's the overwhelming majority of the elements of this type, 109 of the 118 elements of this type, or they're composed of what we call homoatomic molecules. Seven of these are diatomic molecules. That's our have no fear of ice cold beer um, collection of elements. And then we have S4, sorry, S8 and P4 molecules. So some elements are homoatomic molecules. When we go to compounds, some compounds are composed of heteroatomic molecules. The atoms are bound to one another via covalent bonds or molecular bonds to form discrete little bundles of atoms called molecules. Other compounds are composed of ions. In fact, what they're actually composed of are positive cations and negative anions. And these guys are held together via the attraction between these oppositely charged ions, what we call an ionic bond. And what happens is we form a crystal where we have a regularly repeating pattern of positive and negative ions. So we're going to use chemical formulas. We've already kind of been doing this to indicate the composition of different substances, whether they be elements or whether they be compounds, whether they be molecular compounds, whether they be ionic compounds. And so one simple way of doing this is to indicate what we call the formula. The molecular formula indicates the number and type of atoms found in one molecule. So here is a depiction of the molecular formula for the compound methane. And it tells us that in this compound, we have in every molecule one carbon atom 
and four hydrogen atoms. Now, hydrogen peroxide molecules are composed of two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. And so there is the molecular formula for hydrogen peroxide. Sometimes we'll draw what are called structural formulas, and we're going to learn how to do this later on, uh, which attempt to show how atoms in a molecule are connected. And so here is the structural formula for methane, and here is the structural formula for hydrogen peroxide. And so this is telling me that in methane, I've got a carbon atom in the middle of the molecule, and then four hydrogens attached around the edges. Sometimes we'll also use what we call models. This model here is a type of model called a ball and stick model. It's depicting a molecule, just a small collection of atoms. It's actually a methane molecule. You can see that the molecule is not, um, not two-dimensional, it's actually three-dimensional. This is another type of model depicting the same compound, but this one is what we call a space-filling molecule, and it's attempting to show how the, uh, the amount of space that each of the atoms take up in a kind of relatively realistic way. Here's another ball and stick model, this time not for a molecule, but for a crystal. Okay, so chemical formulas are used to specify both the number and type of atoms in a compound or in a molecule. So sometimes we're talking about a homoatomic molecule. So we're talking about an element. We can still write a formula here. This is saying that these molecules contain two nitrogen atoms. So in a chemical formula, what we do is the type of each atom, we write the type of each atom using its element symbol. And then the number of each atom is indicating following the symbol using a subscript. Something to keep in mind is if there is only one of an atom type present, you don't have to put the subscript one in because it's redundant. So this is describing the compound that contains nitrogen and oxygen in a one to one ratio. And you can see that we have no subscripts there. Okay, so not too bad, right? Pretty easy going. You've probably seen things like this. We'll give you more and more rules about how to write the formulas of compounds as we move through the um, course. You're probably wondering at the moment, what is the order that I put these um, atomic symbols in? For a molecular compound, the chemical formula always gives the number of atoms of each type in a molecule. So H2O2 tells me I have two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms in every molecule. For an ionic compound, it's a little different, right? Because we don't have molecules. What we have is this like approximately infinite collection of ions. So what we write for the ionic compound is the ratio of ions that is present in the compound, the simplest ratio of ions, the ratio of ions that are present in one formula unit. So rather than writing, you know, like Na infinity, Cl infinity like that, we don't write that. We just say that these guys are in a one-to-one -one ratio. So therefore, we write for the formula as NaCl. So it's always the simplest ratio of the components. Note that for a molecular compound, the formula of the molecule is not simplified to the simplest ratio. Okay, that's something else. We write the exact number of atoms that are present in one molecule. Now, sometimes we will see groups of atoms occurring consistently together. And um, often what we'll do is we'll use parentheses and then a multiplier outside those um, that parentheses to indicate multiple groups of that collection of atoms. So one group of atoms that we'll often see together is SO4. So in this compound is saying we've got two aluminum atoms and then four, uh, three lots of SO4. So if I want to figure out how many atoms of each type in here, I have to go, well, I've got two aluminums, but then I've got three times the sulfur, and then I've got three times four, 12 oxygen atoms. We can see that again here, C2H5, this unit is repeated four times. So I've got one lead, but then I've got four times two, eight carbons, and then four times five, 20 hydrogen atoms. 
This one's quite elaborate here. You can see that I have 10 calcium atoms, and then I've got six lots of PO4, so I've got six phosphorus, and then I've got a little bit of, I've got oxygen in multiple places here, so it's gonna take a little bit to account for that. So I'm gonna skip over that and look at the hydrogen. Then I've got two hydrogens, and then now I have to figure out the oxygens. Well, I've got four times six from that first um, group of atoms there, and then I've got another two times one for the oxygens that are in the second group of atoms there. So four times six is 24, plus two is 26 oxygen atoms. So, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a puzzle to figure out how many of each type of atom there are. So a few conventions to get us going with writing formulas. We'll, like I said, we'll add more in as we go along, but this will keep us on the right track for the time being. When you begin to write a formula, you wanna write the symbol for each element followed by a subscript indicating how many of that atom type there are in the compound keeping in mind that there's no need to use a subscript of one. So we would write H2O rather than H2O1. Then you need to get everything in the correct order. And the first rule that we're gonna to use to help us is that we typically will write the atoms in the order left to right as they appear in the periodic table. Now, there are a couple of um, hiccups that can occur along the way. The first is, what about if two elements are in the same position left to right in the periodic table? So for example, oxygen and sulfur are both in group six. And the rule is pretty simple. What we do is if they're both of the atom types present are in the same position left to right across the periodic table, we write the element that comes lower in the periodic table first. So if I've got the compound that has one sulfur and three oxygens, because sulfur comes lower than oxygen, I'm gonna call this SO3 rather than O3S, okay. Now, our third um, rule that we're gonna be using at the moment is concerning hydrogen. Hydrogen's a little bit weird. It's a non-metal, but it appears on the far left of the periodic table. And the rule that we have for hydrogen is that it comes at the end of your formula, generally, except for it always comes before any element from group 6A or 7A. So when I look at this compound here, CH3I, Carbon is in group 4A, and then I've got hydrogen, which is what I'm interested in trying to place, and then I've got iodine, which is in group 7A. So we always go from lowest group number to um, highest group number. So you would think that hydrogen being in 1A would come first, but remember hydrogen always comes after everything else with the two exception, except for elements that are in group 6A or 7A. So the order here is going to be carbon, hydrogen, iodine, okay? So we see a similar order in this next compound here where we have C, H, and O, because O is in group 6A. So again, the hydrogen is gonna come after the carbon, which is the furthest to the left, but it comes before the oxygen because we have a special rule for elements that are in um, 6A. Now, if I go to something like, oh, here we go, this one here, H2O2, hydrogen's in 1A, oxygen is in group 6A, what's our rule? Hydrogen comes before any elements that are in 6A, so we can see we have the order hydrogen, then oxygen. So sometimes it's a little weird putting things in the correct order. Okay, we're getting close to wanting to be practicing some of this stuff. We need to define a one term um, that's useful for doing homework and stuff that you're gonna read on the internet that isn't well defined in your book. It's called the empirical formula. And the empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio of elements present in a compound. Now, the, uh, the formula for an ionic compound is always the empirical formula. However, for a molecular compound, 
the molecular formula might not be the empirical formula. It might just not be the simplest whole number ratio of the elements present. So for example, hydrogen peroxide has a molecular formula H2O2. We've mentioned that quite a lot. But its empirical formula, the simplest whole number ratio of the elements present in the compound, we can divide through by the common multiple of two there. The empirical formula would be H. Oh, and sometimes these, you know, we have like quite um, elaborate molecules and the empirical formula is quite a lot simpler than the molecular formula. It's important to recognize that for an ionic compound, the formula of the ionic compound is always the empirical formula, but it might not be for a molecule. All right, so let's get on with practicing some questions. So here we go, we've got four sketches of pure substances, so that means they're either elements or compounds. And then it says each sketch is drawn as if a sample of the substance were under a microscope, so powerful that individual atoms could be, could be seen. Decide whether each sketch shows a pure sample of an element or a pure sample of a compound. So all we're looking for here is elements. We only got one type <coughs> of atom one atom type compound two or more atom types okay and it's all about the types of atoms so our first one here oh it looks like it's a crystalline solid there's only one type of atom present these purple ones it's an element the second one here looks like it's either a gas or a liquid the particles are quite um, away from one another there's only one type of atom present, these white atoms, but it's a diatomic molecule um, that's making up this substance. As there's only one type of atom present, it's an element. In this case, there's clearly two types of atoms present. There are these sort of like gold ones, and then there are these like copper ones. So it has to be a compound. And in substance D here, again, it looks like we've just got some diatomic homoatomic molecules. So as there's only one type of atom present, it must be an element. Okay, looks like we've got the same thing again. Let's make sure we read the question carefully though. Here are four sketches of pure substances. Each sketch is drawn as if a sample of the substance were under a microscope so powerful that individual atoms could be seen. Decide whether each sketch shows a pure sample of an element or a pure sample of a compound. So it is the same again. So this guy here, it looks like it is a monatomic element. And it looks like it's a solid, a crystalline solid. There's only one atom type there, so it must be an element. This guy here is composed of diatomic molecules, and they are homoatomic molecules. They are molecules containing the same types of atoms, so it must be an element because we've only got one type of atom present. Substance C looks very, very similar to B, but the, the molecules are a little bit further apart. They are diatomic molecules. They are homoatomic molecules. There's only one type of atom present. It has to be an element. Okay, substance D here looks like we've got some diatomic molecules, but they are heteroatomic. We've got two different types of atoms present, so that means it must be a compound. Okay, now this question here is asking us to try and decide whether something is a pure substance or a mixture or if we can't decide that. Now this is quite tricky. For a mixture, what we have to keep in mind is that the different components retain their different properties, their individual properties. So we might get multiple properties. So you might get multiple boiling points, multiple melting points, multiple density, right? But if it's a pure substance, you only get one single property for each of those things 
or for any single property, there's only one value. There's one melting point, one boiling point, one density, etc. So that's how we're going to kind of distinguish between these two things. So it looks like we've got two samples of matter, sample A and sample B, and we're given a little bit of a narrative about each of them. So let's see what they've got to say about sample A. And I want to give you a warning. Some of these are like quite tricky. You do have to use your scientific reasoning um, here to work through this. So it says sample A is a solid yellow cube. It has a total mass of 50 grams. The cube is divided into two smaller subsamples of 25 grams. So you're going to cut it in half. And the volume of each subsample is measured. So, okay, no problem. The volume of the first is 48.2 centimeters cubed, and the volume of the second is 58.1 centimeters cubed. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Because what you're saying is the two halves have a different density, right? Even though they have the same mass that's cut in into equal masses, they have different volumes, which means they must have different densities. So you've got like two different densities going on here. So it's got to be a mixture, right? Because pure substances have a single density. Then it says when the experiment is repeated with a new 50 gram sample, the volume of the two 25 gram subsamples, again, you get two different densities. So this looks like it's a heterogeneous mixture, right? Every time you cut it in half, the, you divide it into equal portions, but they occupy, by mass, they occupy different amounts of spaces. So this has got to be, it's got to be a mixture. All right, it's got to be a mixture. So um, that's what we're going with there because the, the density is not consistent, right? Okay. Now, sample B is a clear liquid. That doesn't really help you in any way. The density of the liquid is measured and it turns out to be 0.77 grams per mil. Well, that's just the density of, it, could, it doesn't tell you anything at this point. And then it says you're going to cool it down and at 10 degrees Celsius, it separates into two layers. Again, it's got to be a mixture, right? The reason they're separating into two layers is because there's two liquids there that have different densities. And so it's kind of like how oil floats on water. Oil is less dense than water, so it floats on top. So this is really saying that when you cool these things down, they don't combine as well, and they separate out according to their density. So this is a mixture. Now, that's really tricky, that question, right? It's really, really tricky. Okay, this one's a little easier. It says, here are four sketches of substances. Each sketch is drawn as if a sample of the substance were under a microscope so powerful that individual atoms could be seen. Decide whether it's an element, compound, or mixture. Now, elements are easy to spot because you only have one type of atom present. So if I look through here, there's one that leaps out as being an element, and that's got to be substance Y. Now, a compound, these are all, none of these are crystals, so they're all going to be molecular compounds, is going to have a single type of molecule present, whereas a mixture are going to have multiple different types of molecules present or a molecule and some atoms present but it's going to have multiple different things present so if you look here you can see that this substance here substance z actually has three different types of molecules present it has these heteroatomic diatomic molecules it has these homoatomic diatomic molecules and then it has a second homoatomic diatomic molecule so this is a combination of two different elements and a compound so this is a mixture okay 
Now, you always want to look really carefully when you're thinking that something is a pure substance that it really does only contain the one substance. So when I look in here, I can see that this is looking like it's got just the one type of molecule. It's a heteroatomic molecule and it's a diatomic molecule. And if I check all of these, yep, they're all the same. So this guy's got to be a compound. Now, if I go over to substance T over here, what have we got here? We've got these triatomic molecules, and it looks like they, and they're heteroatomic, and it looks like each of them contain two red ones and one of those sort of purpley color ones. And I'm just checking every molecule to make sure that they're all the same type, and they are, so that must be a compound. Okay. So now we're going to look at analyzing a formula and we're going back to looking at what happens when we have parentheses. So when we have parentheses in a formula, we have to multiply everything that's inside the parentheses by the multiplier there. So if I was to write this out longhand, this formula would be SI3, then hydrogen, we would have three times three, we would have nine of those, and then we've got one nitrogen atom. So another way of kind of writing this out would be Si3H9N. So this question was asking how many silicon atoms are there and the answer is going to be three. All right, so now we're asked to write the chemical formula for a, for a molecule where we're given a model of it and you can move the slider around and make it spin. So let's have a look at what we've got here. It looks like we've got one carbon, one of those black ones, and then we've got one of these yellow ones. We've got one sulfur. And then finally, we've got one, two, three, four. We've got four hydrogens. So now we want to get everything in the correct um, order, right? And remember what we said, we're going to put them in the order from left to right, from lowest group number to highest group number across the periodic table, but there's weirdness with hydrogen. It comes after everything except group 6A and 7A elements. So what's the element that's furthest to the left that's not hydrogen? Is it carbon? Is it sulfur? So it's carbon. So we know that carbon is going to be the first thing in our formula. And then um, what comes next? Well, it's going to be, well, it's not going to be the, you know, hydrogen doesn't come first, right? Hydrogen doesn't come first first, but is it hydrogen or is it sulfur? And so well, hydrogen normally comes after everything except for group 6A and 7A elements. And sulfur is in group 6A. So sulfur is going to come first and then we're going to follow that. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, hydrogen is going to come next because it comes after everything except elements in um in group 6A or 7A, so it's going to be CH4, and then finally it's going to be S. So that would be CH4S. Okay, it takes a little practice to get those right. Take your time with them. Just follow through those M3 rules that I've given. In Alex, they give you elaborate rules as well in the explanation that can help you. All right, let's look at this one. We've got another one here. So what have we got? We've got one carbon in the middle. There's carbon, it's in group 4A. I'm going to write that out there, 4A. We've got one iodine. It's in group 7A. And we've got one bromine, and it's also in group 7A. Now, iodine comes after bromine. So I know that we always write the element that appears um, lower in the group first. So I know that it's going to go iodine, bromine. Okay, so those two are going to be in that order. All right, now what comes, um, what, so we know those, the order of those two. So we've got to think about hydrogen. Where does hydrogen come? Hydrogen comes normally at the end 
but it'll come before anything from group 7a or 6a. So bromine and iodine are in 7a. So hydrogen's going to come before them. We've got two of them. And then carbon is in group 4a, so it goes at the beginning. So it's kind of like lowest group number to highest group number. If they're in the same group, the one that is in lower in the group will come first. And then hydrogen always comes at the end, except for, there's a little rule there, it comes before anything in group 6a or 7a. So that would be our formula there, CH2IBr. Okay, so that concludes the video um, concerning compounds and formulas. I hope that it was helpful. And um, if you have any problems with the content, please just you know reach out to me either via office hours or just fire me a Canvas message. Okay, have fun. Bye.